Hi everyone and welcome along to the June edition of uh, the Influential Times podcast. As per usual I have my uh, lovely co-host Tom with me. Hi everyone, good to be here again. And we are going to talk through some of the biggest stories in the world of social media and influencer marketing in particular. Um, so I was going to kick off with um, sort of Twitter really announcing a bit more detail on on kind of some of their plans for monetization for, for creators on the platform. So it comes off the back of sort of, you know, big, big bunch of features around spaces. They're now going to allow, uh, I think, a, a sort of subset of users. Uh, they'll need to have basically run a space in the last few days. Well, I think, you know, three in the last month or something like that. They'll need at least a thousand followers. Um, and if you sort of clear those criteria, then you'll be able to run a ticketed space. So a kind of revenue revenue stream for people. Um, it sort of goes along with the, the super follows as well. It looks like initially, at least, they're really going to just take a very small cut uh, on the first $50,000 that you that you make. So, I mean, you know, I think a good a good revenue stream. Again, it's just like this trend we're seeing this year of suddenly there's been this huge kind of scramble for the creator economy that's been building up a bit. And I think it's obviously going to be tough on creators to, to sort of keep bringing stuff out. And I'm seeing more articles about sort of creator burnout and things like that. And that that being tough. I'm sort of hopeful in the B2B space. It's, you know, there's a slightly slower pace of pace of life. So mm. I, I think I think a good one. I mean, I don't know. Uh, the the three percent fee climbs to 20 percent after uh, fifty thousand dollars. So I don't know with that. I don't know. Would that put you off, Tom? Or if you add fifty thousand I mean, dollars, you're not you're not complaining. Yeah, I think they've probably structured it in quite a fair way, haven't they? I mean, to give the first fifty thousand, I think that's fairly reasonable. And then to twenty percent isn't a ridiculous jump. So, no, I think I think they've probably pitched it around around the right level um, to obviously try and be competitive against other platforms as well. Yeah, it's probably what you'd call uh, adoption pricing, isn't it? Is mm. kind of get get everyone hooked get on, everyone it, on it, and then yeah, yeah and then then start raking in the big bucks if they're doing well. So speaking of other platforms, you've got a story about um, Adam Masseri has kind of announced a bunch <laughs> of a bunch of features uh, that they're looking to focus on at Instagram. Yeah, exactly. Quite a few Instagram updates, actually. I think the kind of thing that's driving this is is to stay ahead or to, or to stay alongside, really, platforms like TikTok and YouTube. I think TikTok have grown, obviously, unbelievably quickly in the last couple of years. Um, and yeah, they're really trying to do a lot to keep up. Um, so I think one of the areas where TikTok have done really, really well is with their interest-based video content. We mm. can obviously put in your interests and it will suggest content. It'll obviously learn what you like watching and it will, you know, put stuff in front of you that you're interested in. Um, so I think Instagram are trying to improve that on their platform. Um, they're going to have some features coming out where you can kind of, you can say whether you're interested in something. You can almost like, you know, on the post you see, say, yes, this is something I'm interested in or not. And then it will it will basically learn about you over time and hopefully put more relevant and interesting content in front of you. Um, they also want to improve what they're doing with video. So um, I know IGTV came out, I think about two or three years ago now, but hasn't really done too well. A few yeah. people saying possibly because it's on mobile and obviously platforms like YouTube, people use on on you know on on a laptop, whatever, slightly bigger screen, etc. So they haven't quite nailed video, and that's something else that they they want to improve on. Um, something else that they announced, similar to the uh, Twitter super followers, they're going to have their own version of that, um, where yeah, creators can essentially pub publish um, exclusive content to their story, and people can pay a subscription to have access to that content. Um, yeah, it's um, they released a few screenshots last week, but it hasn't been put out into the public yet for testing. Um, but they, yeah, it's going to be quite interesting. People will subscribe. They won't be able to screenshot anything. So obviously it will keep it exclusive, um, a bit like like a private story. Um, so yeah, that's that's one of the main things. The only other thing that I, I picked up as well in another article was um, they're also looking into NFTs at the moment as well. Um, so I know we discussed a couple of months ago about um, Jack Dorsey selling his first ever tweet um, and Instagram are looking into this as well now around having like you can almost have like a collection of, N of NFTs within your within your profile. Uh, it's going to be called like collectibles, I think, digital collectibles as a tab. Um, and that seems to be something that Twitter are looking at as well. So, yeah, watch this space for some more NFT updates. 
Yeah, not sure about not sure about that last one. I guess the the close um, the the kind of you know almost monetized stories or like paying for access. I think in practice, um, I've been aware of a few creators over the years doing that anyway. Mm. But they essentially use the close friends feature. Yeah. And have a sort of whitelisted group of people who pay, like who subscribe to their Patreon or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. And then and then you sort of pay to just to, to sort of have access to someone's close friends story. So I guess they're just sort of almost going to where where users already are and trying to make their life a bit a bit easier. And obviously it's good for them if that money flows through their yeah. platform. Yeah. rather than rather than through patreon yeah, yeah i guess yeah they've recognized the fact that people are trying to do it anyway and they found a sort of way of doing that and then they're gonna sort of formalize it make it look a bit cooler um and yeah like you say drive some revenue through it so yeah it's a, it's a good idea yeah i guess uh yeah i guess i, I wish all product decisions were that easy if, there was, <laughs> if you could always kind of spot something people are already doing and just you know figure out how to figure out how to make it easier for them but yeah. uh, unfortunately they're probably not all that easy um <laughs> Speaking of things, uh, speaking of things, well, getting easier or harder, um, my second story is around uh, Apple's announcement at Worldwide Developer Conference that they are are going to be sort of rolling out with, I think, iOS 15. They're going to be rolling out a new sort of privacy protection. The main impact of this is that a lot of tracking pixels for email marketing um, are really are really going to struggle. You, you know, some providers saying this is going to falsely show 100% open rate for Mac users. You know, others worried it, it'll kind of kill it. But I suppose essentially the the issue is that what you're going to see is is a real sort of drop off in the reliability. And obviously, iOS is more popular in some markets than others. It's easy with a US centered focus to sort of think of it as a very, very high proportion of, of users. And it is in the US. Um, whereas it's, it's sort of more a 70-30 split in, uh, in EMEA. Um, so far as I know, in, in terms of sort of you know seventy percent Android, thirty percent iOS users, so could be a little bit of a sort of cultural difference there, or uh, in, ter- in terms of Apple's penetration. But I think it raises it raises some interesting sort of questions for um, for people who've bet heavily on newsletters. You know, Substack, re- Twitter acquired Review. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of journalists like uh, Casey Newton sort of starting his own um, Substack as a sort of, you know, uh, as his main main job, really. Um, so, you know, all the advice of creators to kind of build your email newsletter list, make sure you're, you're kind of building, you're not building on rented land, as it were, uh, to mm. use the phrase, friend of the show, Scott Guthrie, once used to me. Um, you know, it's kind of owning your own set of really knowing about your audience and having a sort of direct line to them where you know they get the message. It's not like you put a post out and maybe they see it. Everyone gets the email. Mm-hmm. Everyone has really kind of um, has subscribed to it. So, I mean, a, a sort of challenge ahead, I think actually what will end up happening is maybe more marketers will learn from those types of people, the creatives with their yeah. own newsletter, where it's really focusing on like high quality, exciting content. Because I have a handful of newsletters I subscribe to on on kind of things like internet culture and, you know, news and, and things like that, that I open, you know, every time I get them, every week I will go and I'll mm-hmm. go and check for them um because the content's really interesting so i think really the lesson is 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 that but um i don't know maybe our marketing team feels differently about the change and <laughs> and they're, they're a bit more worried yeah um, we'll see how it plays out so we find out so we're uh we're, we're finishing with uh, a sort of celebrity slash euros themed um yeah story that's the that's the european soccer championships for our american viewers yeah, exactly. I thought it'd be hard to to do the June edition without mentioning Cristiano Ronaldo and his infamous Coca-Cola. In, I don't know if you'd call it an incident, a stunt, or whatever. But um, but yeah, obviously storm in a teacup. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, as everyone probably probably saw, he he moved two Coca-Cola bottles out of his view in within the um, one of the press conferences during the tournament. Um, and if this raised quite a few, quite a bit of conversation in the influencer marketing world around kind of brand partnerships and authenticity and things like that and I thought it'd be an interesting one for us to discuss Jack I think what was interesting was obviously their Coca-Cola share price dipped by four billion after the event which is kind of mad that someone one person can have such a big impact but I guess once the dust settled people started saying well they got quite a lot of coverage from it and a lot of mentions so I suppose you know once the share price goes back up then overall it might be it perhaps would be a, a positive impact for them 
Um, yeah, maybe maybe the only maybe the only thing affected is how is how kind of likely the CEO is to get his his bonus from the board or something like that yeah, for the true. for the share price. The yeah. marketing team might be happy, but not the not yeah the board. exactly. <laughs> you know, I think the, yeah probably could be one of those you know all coverage is good coverage kind of stories mm. where yeah yeah. I mean, I think you know I've certainly found myself thinking God I could really use a diet coke in the last uh, in the last few months so yeah um it you know and this this hasn't really affected it I think you know the the point around authenticity obviously it, it's kind of self evident it's the type of thing we always talk about isn't it and like it's interesting to see that sort of older style of endorsement you know the official tournament sponsor and their product displays there's sort of there's a there's a lot of emphasis on sort of Heineken zero. Yeah. Uh, alcohol beers at the minute they're sponsoring all the kind of player of the match and things like that and it's kind of yeah seeing that sort of collide with someone who's got his own center of gravity like Ronaldo mm. like he's become the sort of highest the the most valuable person on Instagram or something someone I saw a piece of sort of press coverage of that the other day yeah it's sort of interesting to see those two collide that he's able to kind of ignore the rules you know you're you're probably not supposed to touch those but his his mm. sort of own Hard to say, I don't know, do you think that's kind of, is that because of his his just old school star power? Like, you know, yeah. I don't know, Woods, I guess, uh, I'm trying to think of an old an old fashioned star like Frank Sinatra or something would have been able to do that as well. Yeah, I guess the, the interesting point is around, you know, the, the brand partnerships, like, you know, products like Coca-Cola, there's like McDonald's who I know have done a lot of sponsorship in, in like tournaments like this. Like, I don't know, people were saying in the industry should they be looking for more like relevant sponsorship sponsorships where when you're associated with athletes like Ronaldo should it be more like sports drinks and like health like healthier options like that was that was some of the questions I was hearing which I thought was interesting yeah it feels like a sort of very blunt instrument doesn't it to just have this sort of overall sponsor and you have a bunch of it on billboards yeah in a world where kind of you know people are consuming it on their laptops people are you know, people watch watch stuff on their phones or that, you know, everyone will have their own, you know, the amount of demographic data available on a lot of viewers is probably quite high. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I guess as we as we talked about in the, the male privacy thing, there's a sort of pushback against that. So mm. maybe we're going to have to go back to, you know, the, the sort of simple, um, the simple things with a with a less targeted approach. So yeah it does i think i think you're right it kind of neatly sums up a, a lot of the sort of crossroads it feels like the the um the creator economies are even that phrase feels like it's sort of it's it's gotten to the point in the curve where like i'm hearing it a lot and people are starting to comment on how much they're hearing it and there's mm. a sort of bit of pushback going could everyone please stop saying the creator economy all the time <laughs> um which which is usually just a sign that it's kind of it's, it's nowhere near stopping uh um, yeah it's just, yeah, it, it would suggest to me it's really gathering momentum. But yeah, some uh, some big some big questions to answer. As always, I'm sure you know these things are less less of a crossroads than they appear, and it's just an evolution in the kind of in the in the industry, and people people will learn to adjust, won't they? Mm, yeah, absolutely. And as you mentioned, obviously Ronaldo as well getting to number one on the Instagram rich list. I don't know if you've seen how much he gets paid per post, but something in the region of 1.6 million dollars which isn't bad um that's all right isn't it yeah it's not bad. It's not, especially if you don't have to give a 20 percent cut to twitter you know, <laughs> well, exactly yeah um, um but yeah he's earning i, I guess we'll, i guess we'll see what fees uh instagram on release when they when they yeah. sort of put out their super follows feature yeah, exactly um but yeah he's earning something in the region of 40 million dollars per year just from instagram and obviously that's you know aside from what he gets paid to play football his sponsorship deals and everything else so yeah it's pretty uh pretty eye-watering but he has got the most followers in the world i think he's got about 300 million followers now and interestingly shot up by 100 million during the since the pandemic as well so just goes to show that like social media activity has definitely increased over the last year and a half yeah I'd I'd be really interested in just seeing the kind of the performance stats on that, you know, if you, what yeah, the views are on on yeah, yeah. what whether his click through percentage is particularly good or whether actually it's just the numbers are so huge that yeah the association I guess in people's minds and things like that yeah yeah interesting, interesting. stuff interesting yeah absolutely my um my kind of bonus story this month is going to be about uh it's it's adam masseri again he's put a post out about how the instagram 
algorithm works in fact he actually pushes back on use of the term algorithm he says you know that doesn't really describe how it works there's a few things running concurrently etc but it's quite detailed it's it's you know i think really useful as a primer for these conversations obviously he'll have his own agenda and how he how he frames it and how he wants it to come across but i thought you know for marketers really useful to look at having read it my my sense is it's pretty similar to to how you know other other big social platforms have kind of hinted their algorithm works obviously that they'll they'll all have their own kind of or have their own agendas you know top twitter's really worried about showing you stuff outside of your kind of filter bubble as it were um you know tiktok is really really focused on kind of having a a really close sense of what you're interested in right now and is very responsive um instagram have have their own way of doing it so definitely give that a read would would sort of suggest it's it's kind of required reading for all social media professionals um and yeah we you will have our you will have our summarized thoughts in your inbox shortly when you're uh, or you probably already do by the time you're reading this so uh, once again for this month it is goodbye from me and it is goodbye from tom cheers everyone